and I'm a research associate at Imperial College London. I'm also the chair of the Imperial Lifecycle Network and I'll, I'll also be your chair for this session today. So today the Imperial Lifecycle Network is very happy to be able to present Professor Bernard Stubing from the University of Leiden. He'll be giving his talk on including broad future scenarios in perspective LCA. Before I hand over to Bernard, just a few quick words on housekeeping, as well as a bit of an introduction to the network and our seminar series for anyone who's new. So today's session is being recorded, so please mute your microphones as well as switch off your cameras so that we can save bandwidth. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end. Uh, my colleague Eva will be handling the, the Q&A, so if you have any questions, please, please type these into the chat. If for whatever reason you require subtitles, these can be switched on in Microsoft Teams. At the top of your screen, there should be a little button with three small dots on. Click on that and you will find the option to enable live captioning throughout the seminar. Um, so I think that's all the housekeeping. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, a copy of the slides will also be sent out to all the registered attendees. And as I said, the session is being recorded and the video will be made available through our YouTube channel. You'll be notified by email uh, when these are available. So a little bit about the network. So the Imperial Lifecycle Network is a network based at Imperial, which aims to bring together and connect lifecycle related research and researchers across Imperial as well as the wider lifecycle community. The purpose of the network is to foster collaborations and facilitate networking as well as to share knowledge and contribute towards advancements within the life cycle field. For further information about the network, uh, visit our website, follow us on Twitter, and for any UK-based life cycle practitioners, consider joining the Life Cycle Community Group UK. So about our seminar series. So today's session is the ninth series seminar that we've hosted so far. Um, recordings and or slides used in past seminars are available through our website, so please check that out for to see who's presented and what was presented uh, previously. Um, our next seminar is actually going to be on October 25th, where we'll have Dr. Michael Gold Goldsworthy from Drax, and he'll be giving a presentation on carbon accounting in the biomass sector the role of biogenic carbon in net zero targets. So if that sounds interesting, um, the event page for that is currently live, so you can go and register for that. You can find the information on our website. So moving on to today's speaker. So today the network is very happy to be able to host Professor Bernard Stubing, who's an associate professor at Leiden University. And he'll be giving his talk, including broad future scenarios in prospective LCA. So Bernard works as an associate professor in the Department of Industrial Ecology at the Institute of Environmental Science, or also known as CML, at Leiden University. Um, Bernard specialises on the further development of life cycle assessment and related methods and applies these to answer sustainability related questions in energy, electric mobility, the built environment and other areas. Currently, he's dedicating most of his time and efforts towards the advancement of data methods, um, open software and future oriented, i.e. perspective or ex ante LCA, to provide decision support for the transition to a more circular and sustainable economy. Bernard received his PhD from EPFL on the availability and optimal use of biomass for bioenergy while working at the Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Science and Technology. During his postdoc at ETH Zurich, he coordinated a project on the optimal environmental use of wood resources and was part of the EcoInvent expert group. Um, he then joined the development of the open source LC active, uh, software activity browser. And in 2015, Bernard joined CML at Leiden University as a tenure track assistant professor, but not before first embarking on a year long sailing trip across the Atlantic. And in 2022, this year, uh, Bernard completed his tenure track and be officially became a professor. So with that, Bernard, I'll hand over to you and I will stop screen sharing. So over to you, Bernard. Okay, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, you can see that. Excellent. Um, all right, well, after that very nice introduction, I don't have to say anything about myself anymore. 
Um, I have the honor today to talk here about including future scenarios into prospective LCA. Um, and I'd really like to show the next slide because um, that, that is our uh, prospective or ex ante LCA team at CML, and there's more people than listed on this slide. Uh, you can see the, the nice canals and, and uh, university buildings of Leiden here. And uh, this is also to say a little bit that uh, what I'm presenting here today is by no means uh, just my own work. Um, it goes uh, beyond that within this group and beyond the Institute. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is actually why do we need for uh, broad future background scenarios for prospective LCA in the first place? Uh, and then uh, I, I'll try to give an overview of recent um, tools and ways of generating uh, and using prospective LCI databases. I'll uh, talk about um, whether it matters or not by looking uh, at some of the uh, results of recent studies uh, where we use prospective LCI uh, databases. And I'll also give um, uh, my own perspective, let's say, on, on challenges and, and possible uh, next steps um, to make this even uh, yeah, more practical for a wider audience. So uh, it's clear that today we live in an era of great technological change. We live in an era of climate change. And uh, we need environmental guidance. That's really important. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, none of that, uh, what I show here on the slide, will be very new to you. You know we're having a mobility transition. Uh, there is an energy transition in, in full swing. We're talking about the bioeconomy. Uh, we are very innovative as, as humankind, um, developing new materials. As I said it to you, and then I separately realized that we're going to send it to everyone else too. And technologies uh, constantly. Uh, and even there may be new technologies like artificial intelligence, which um, again change a lot of the technology that, that we have. Um, so we live in this time of, of transitions, and, and this is where prospective LCA uh, or ex-ante LCA as, a, as a tool to anticipate environmental impacts of products and services for future technologies is really a very important tool. Um, and what we do in, in prospective LCA is uh, fundamentally we develop scenarios for the future uh, to assess how specific technologies could perform environmentally uh, in the future. So we really need scenarios, but what is a scenario? A scenario, and here I'm using an IPCC uh, definition, a scenario is a description of how the future may develop based on a coherent and internally consistent set of assumptions. And while I very much like this a description of what a scenario is. Um, when you read further, it becomes more specific here. And in the IPCC then says, so it's um, about a set of consistent assumptions about key drivers, including demography, economic processes, technological innovation, governance, lifestyles, and relationships between these uh, driving forces. Um, so that's a perfectly valid definition of a scenario, but of course you may also be thinking of something completely different when, when talking about a scenario. So actually we need different kinds of scenarios. And um, what we have here on the left, I think you can see my pointer here. Sorry, that's the laser pen, laser pointer. On the left is uh, the definition of scenarios that we just heard is, perfectly fitting for broad global scenarios for how the global economy would develop. Uh, and that is, of course, of uh, general relevance for, for LCA or for prospective LCAs. Um, so I think here we're talking about background scenarios, right? How will the future of this planet um, technologically look like in, in the broad scheme? Uh, but then, of course, we could talk about uh, scenarios uh, from a very different perspective. We could look at specific technologies 
Um, and that's what we often do in prospective LCA. We look at uh, here, I, had, I have two flow diagrams for um, different electrolyzers. Uh, and we could also see these here as you know, possible future scenarios. And here we talk about foreground scenarios. And in this talk, I will mainly focus on background scenarios. So uh, let's put the, uh, these two a little bit into uh, a relation with each other. Let's assume we are a car manufacturer that wants to make a prospective LCA for an electric vehicle in 2030. We, we might start by drawing up a flowchart like this, where we have the EV use, the EV production uh, that consumes electricity, and then we have some inputs of steel and batteries and, and different technologies for generating electricity. We'll uh, probably divide our system or think of our system in terms of a foreground system and a background system. We'll probably develop some scenarios here for how the EV specifically will look like in 2030 and how it will be used. And um, it would be good to include uh, also scenarios for how the general background system or the wider economy will develop. And this is quite difficult to do for individual stakeho stakeholders. Um, why is this difficult? because our economy is deeply interlinked. So um, we could, of course, if we are modeling this foreground system here, we could easily um, adapt the electricity mix a little bit so that the EV use uh, and, and maybe also the EV production would receive uh, different electricity. We can still do that for the batteries, or we could also do it for the steel, right? But uh, the more we go um, further away from, from our functional unit here, the more difficult and the more complex that, that system, so the more we need to change. Uh, for example, we, uh, if, if we look at the future, then we, we actually also have feedbacks between the electricity mix and, and the renewables, right? So uh, the more renewables we will have, the greener the, the electricity and thus the lower the impact of uh, installing additional PV panels, let's say. Uh, so there is feedback loops, and and actually uh, all of the economic system is um, to to a large degree um, interlinked. So it becomes very difficult within an individual study to um, really account for the background in in a very good way. So. Um, yeah, broad future background scenarios could really help LCA practitioners to consider the combined effect of uh, all of the future changes uh, together. Um, we need to be careful when doing this. Um, we may develop foreground scenarios uh, and we need to be careful to choose um, the foreground scenarios in alignment with the background scenarios. So uh, an optimistic uh, vision of the future for the foreground system together with a pessimistic vision for the background system probably doesn't align very well. We should probably be more on this side probably. Uh, we also need to think about temporal consistency. So, uh, and that's one of the, the main reason probably to um, develop background uh, scenarios um, is that we don't want to use a background of today with a foreground system of the future economy. If we were to do that, it would basically be uh, like placing wind turbines in the economic system of the 60s, for example. And you can see by this picture, perhaps more than by my words, that this isn't such a great fit. Uh, is it important to consider the background? Yes, the background matters for LCA results. Um, I'm taking a little bit away the, the message, uh, but I think most of you will know that message already. If we look at um, these two pictures here, an EV once fueled by coal power and once fueled by PV cells, um, that will give very different LCA results. And I'm showing this slide also to, to make these points here that LCA can actually be very influential um, for decision making and for shaping public opinions. So the question is really, well, what will such a technology look like in the future? And it's rather unlikely, I would say, that we have this system. So if we are 
uh, too loud on publishing LCA results. For such a system, we may actually um, drive te technology development or public opinion uh, in, into a wrong direction. So what we should actually be doing is uh, we need to look at the future, not the past, in order to get a better idea of the potential of future technologies. Now, let me introduce uh, properly the term PLCI database, which I've been already using until now. So a PLCI database stands for Prospective Lifecycle Inventory Database. Um, this may not be the best term we can find for that, but that's the term uh, I've been using and, and I will be using in this presentation. Um, what is a PLCI database? Um, the difference to a regular LCI database is that it represents inventory data for a specific point in time, so in the future, um, and uh, for a specific scenario. So that's basically a futurized version of an LCI database. Um, and now let me uh, talk briefly about uh, the history of PLCI databases. Uh, this is short and incomplete, um, but um, these are some milestones in the generation of PLCI databases. It started, um, in my, uh, to my knowledge, with the NEEDS project in, in 2004, um, which was a systematic approach to generate future scenarios of the EcoInvent database um, focused on electricity supply, but also some other sectors. Um, Quite a few years later, uh, we had uh, Gibon and, and Hertrich um, developing the, uh, and, and others developing the, the Themis model. And the Themis model was a combination of uh, an LCI database and a multi regional input output model. And in that combination, uh, they included also scenarios for energy from the IEA, and they built upon the, the needs scenarios. In 2018, uh, Mendoza and, and colleagues uh, published a study uh, when background matters. And I think that was a, uh, or that is a very influential study because it um, uh, had a few interesting innovations. First of all, it combined data from integrated assessment models, IAMs, uh, the model image, and the EcoInvent database. Uh, I'll talk about integrated assessment models in the next slide, so bear with me. Um, and they did that for uh, electricity supply. And the interesting thing of coupling uh, an LCI database with an IAM is that IAMs are fundamentally designed to um, uh, capture the socioeconomic and technological development um, over time, mostly over the next century. Um, and uh, they and build up on SSPs, Shared Socioeconomic Pathways. Uh, you can see them up here. Uh, these are broad storylines about uh, the future of our planet. Uh, and RCPs, which are Representative Concentration Pathways, which have been uh, developed by the IPCC. Um, so they connect to all of this uh, already available scenario building, and, and that's very nice. The other nice innovation here is that um, they started to develop a Python package that can be used for systematic modifications of LCI database, uh, databases, the, the Voost uh, package. And then in, in 2022, um, Romain Saki uh, and colleagues published uh, the premise paper uh, and the premise framework, and that is basically a continuation of this work by Mendoza. And uh, it's a new Python framework that builds up on the Wurst uh, package for generating prospective LCI databases, um, connecting, uh, uh, as of today, two different IAMs, uh, the image model and the Remind model, uh, to the EcoInvent database. And there has been substantial work to include uh, electricity, but also additional sectors. Now, let me briefly talk about IAMs, Integrated Assessment Models. So IAMs are global but regionalized models 
that consider broad socioeconomic and technological developments and their consequences over time. And um, by consequences, I mean environmental impacts, mainly climate change, but also um, socioeconomic criteria. Uh, and then IAMs are used to inform policymakers on issues related to that, so climate change and, and socioeconomic uh, development. Um, IAMs build up on a, a number of key drivers, including population, GDP, food demand, and, and uh, technological developments in different sectors. And they implement, as I already said, the SSPs and the RCPs. And here to the right, you can see um, how the SSPs and RCPs are combined in the latest um, AR6 assessment report from the uh, IPCC. And you can see that in bold, these are the five main um, sort of storylines and uh, concentration pathways for, for CO2 uh, that are being uh, modeled. Um, what do they mean? Basically, here we have a progression. You see, this is the sustainability um, SSP, and then we go, it gets worse here. We, we get to the fossil fuel development. Um, and we also have higher um, emission uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. Um, so the SSP1, uh, 1.9, that's basically uh, consistent with the Paris Agreement, leading to a 1.5 degree warming. Uh, and then we go up here until we have basically a, a no additional climate policy scenario, which uh, leads to a 5 degree warming by 2100. Now let's talk about the premise framework. Um, so what does premise actually do? Premise combines um, data from the IAMs and from the EcoInvent database uh, within the premise uh, framework or using the premise framework and then uh, generates a number of um, future scenario or prospective LCI databases. Uh, typically more than four uh, because we have more scenarios and, and time steps. Um, these can then be exported in uh, various um, LCI data formats for a further use in, for example, SEMA Pro uh, or Brightway or the Activity Browser. Um, and finally, um, there in, in theory, um, we could also, uh, LCA has a lot of interesting information for integrated assessment models. So in theory, we could take back some of that data uh, to improve the IAM world as well. But I will not really talk about that in, in this talk. Um, at this moment, three image and five remind scenarios are available. Um, let's briefly also look at the open source Python packages, because I promised you to also talk about the tools briefly. Uh, so really the underlying framework for all of these packages is the Brightway framework. So Brightway is an open source Python based LCA framework. Um, and all of these other packages are building up on that. So for example, uh, Voos builds up on Brightway and offers a, a way of doing uh, systematic transformations of LCI databases, for example, um, changing uh, the regions of uh, activities or um, yeah, any sort of grouping or aggregation or uh, changing names, changing uh, inputs. Uh, the premise software makes heavy use of that functionality, but additionally brings in a more um, well-defined link with the integrated assessment model. Uh, and that's why the premise framework is uh, now basically the state of the art uh, to couple this kind of data. And then now let's take a, a look also at the right hand side here. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, we get a number of databases as an output here from this exercise. So one database for each scenario and time step. So imagine three scenarios and five time steps, then you end up with uh, 15 uh, LCI databases. And if you're an LCI practitioner, you already know that this is trouble in a way. 
um, because you're used to working with one background database, if you're, for example, the EcoInvent database, but now you have 15 of them. So what do you do? Uh, that, that could be a modeling nightmare. Um, that can be overcome practically by the superstructure approach. What is the superstructure approach? It basically is a way of um, combining all of these databases into a single database uh, that describes sort of the economic structure or superstructure of, of all of these described um, economies here, uh, plus a scenario difference file, which can be used to basically transform that database back into any of these databases uh, in memory, kind of. Um, and this enables LCA practitioners to uh, just work with one background database that can represent uh, at the same time all of these scenarios here. Um, and the only software that currently supports modeling with that, uh, to my knowledge, is the Activity Browser uh, software. And the Activity Browser is a graphical user interface to Brightway, but it also offers additional um, possibilities like uh, Scenario LCA that I just mentioned. Now, what does Premise do in, or try to do in a little bit more um, detail? Uh, it transforms uh, specific sectors uh, so that they represent um, changes in the future. Uh, for example, the power sector, the, the power plant efficiencies are adapted, uh, or different fuel mixes are created uh, in the future, and uh, perhaps new uh, fuel types are being added. Um, hot pollutant emissions are uh, adapted also based on other databases uh, to represent, uh, for example, future efforts to reduce um, emissions. Then um, the share of renewables is accounted for, uh, and uh, also the efficiency developments that we uh, can foresee for, for certain technologies. Uh, Premise also has a, a strong focus on transportation, so there are new passenger and freight um, transport um, modes included. Uh, next to that, uh, there is some focus on uh, important um, industrial sectors, such as cement or steel production. And here also different kinds of developments that could happen in the future are um, at least partly accounted for. Uh, and Premise also adds data sets for carbon capture and storage, uh, which in, in many sectors may play a role in the future. Now, let's zoom in even a little bit more and take the example of power generation. So here we have the IAM and here we have the LCA side or the, the LCI database. Uh, the IAM would here uh, that's the nice thing of, of working or, or using IAM data is because they have um, scenario data for the development of uh, the efficiency or the amount of pollutants uh, that uh, will be related to specific technologies. And this data is basically um, transferred then to the LCI database so that it reflects these developments here. And the same goes for market mixes. So um, uh, any EcoInvent user will know that EcoInvent heavily works with these markets, which represent uh, basically consumption mixes, um, the average electricity supply, for example. But of course, that will change in the future, and that is also accounted for. Another uh, important um, uh, maybe detail to, to know is that uh, in a prospective LCI database based on IAMs, the regions of transformed sectors are defined by the IAM. So that means um, uh, typically, for example, the Remind model has 13 regions and image, I believe, 26. Um, that means we will change the region, regional resolution of uh, products in Econvent to that of the IAM. And that may be losing regional detail, like in the case of electricity, or it may be actually gaining uh, regional detail uh, as for many other products. 
Now, is this important? Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, results um, of, of these efforts. Uh, this is from the uh, premise paper. Uh, here we can see the development over time in terms of um, normalized climate change uh, emissions. So this is the starting point in 2020. And then the development over time for different um, products. Here we see clinker, electricity, transportation and steel. And we see that uh, there is an effect of these different scenarios. Here we have the range of scenarios from 1.5 degrees to uh, 3 to 4 degrees warming for both the image and the remind model. And we see that uh, we have a, a widespread of results depending on the scenario and, and the model. Um, and the, let's say that the biggest change or the biggest decarbonization happens in the electricity sector. Um, but all of the combined changes together, including uh, electricity as a major driver, lead to um, changes basically for every product uh, that we will have in the future. Um, specifically, uh, I'll talk about results from a, from a few studies now uh, to give you some of the insights that uh, we, we have gained so far. Um, for example, here on electric vehicles uh, and metals. Here we can see the uh, work of uh, Mendoza and colleagues, um, where we see how the different scenarios lead to no decarbonization or even a 75 or up to a 75% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions related uh, to driving an EV. So that's a substantial spread, but also a substantial possibility. And um, in this scenario, it's really just the electricity mix driving uh, that change. Uh, here we have a study by uh, Harbrecht and uh, yeah, by Harbrecht uh, that is based on Mendoza, um, looking at future scenarios for different metals, and uh, the electricity is a key driver in that as well. Uh, and we get some good news from, from that study as well, that for most metals that we looked at here, we see a slight um, decarbonization over time. Now keep in mind that's only uh, at the per kilogram level, right? That doesn't mean that in absolute, absolute terms that we're um, generating less uh, impacts in the future. Uh, but for certain Key metals such as copper, we, we see even a potential of something like 70% uh, uh, decarbonization. Now, a more recent study by uh, XU uh, based on premise and, and also the um, uh, scenarios for the metals from Harbrecht and Maide. Um, and here we're looking at EV batteries, lithium ion batteries, uh, and in very brief, um, Green is the electricity here, and here we have 2020. Here we have a, a three to four degree uh, warming scenario, and here we have a two degree warming scenario. And you can see that for the future, so for 2050, we will have substantial uh, reductions in uh, the, the carbon intensity of, of EV batteries um, due to the um, greener uh, energy supply and, and uh, metals supply. If we look at chemicals, um, here is the example of ammonia production. That's a very uh, recent study, still in preparation. Um, we see for the three different scenarios that we have that, um, uh, and, and this is act actually in um, megatons, so in, in absolute um, uh, global uh, emissions, we can see that um, we may not decarbonize at all depending on the scenario, right? So two scenarios actually show either an upwards or a, a constant trend. And only in the most ambitious scenario, uh, we can see substantial reductions. Uh, and these are due to a mix of uh, reduced demand, uh, cleaner electricity, the shift to green hydrogen for ammonia production and uh, carbon capture and storage. Now let's take a further look at uh, cement production and as part of bulk uh, materials. 
uh, also a very recent uh, study. And um, here we can see this is today's world. And here we're moving to 2060 in uh, three scenarios. Um, and we can see that in the more ambitious scenarios, we're actually able to substantially um, bring down cement related uh, greenhouse gas emissions. However, a major factor in that is uh, the reliance of on CCS. Uh, so I would say there is still considerable uncertainty to these results um, because uh, we rely on CCS and that's not yet so sure how, how and if it will be implemented. But this study can at least show the potential and also highlight um, that this uh, we need to talk perhaps more about uh, CCS then. Um, the study also showed that there may be trade-offs with other environmental impact categories. And um, my apologies here that I mainly talk about greenhouse gas emissions, but um, we should be trying, of course, to look at uh, the full environmental impacts uh, always. And then finally, last uh, example here, a study by Young, also from published this year, based on premise, um, where we look at um, building materials in the Netherlands for the for the Dutch building stock, uh, and how greenhouse gas emissions related to that will develop. Uh, and you can see that, uh, well, there's a slight decrease uh, also in a not so ambitious scenario and in a more ambitious scenario there is a stronger decrease uh, but not a as full decarbonization as um, uh, you've seen maybe for some other products now um, and um, th this is slightly different at the operational level so if we look at um, energy use in buildings, this is materials. If we look at energy use in buildings, um, then the picture is different. Then we can get quite low, especially uh, with, a, uh, with a more optimistic scenario. There is more such studies if you're interested in uh, reading more about that. So I listed a few of these here and I also have a, a reference slide in the end where you can find the exact details. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, challenges for prospective LCI databases. One challenge is certainly uh, sectoral coverage. Here on the right you see greenhouse gas uh, emissions by sector published by Our World in Data and I just try to overlay a little bit here what we have already uh, covered um, in, in the premise framework. Uh, so we uh, include uh, electricity and fuels, so we cover, uh, let's say, a substantial part of that energy picture, not the full one yet. Uh, we cover cement, we cover steel, uh, we cover road transport, uh, but you can see there's lots of gaps. So if we want to uh, have a, uh, let's say, a, a really full picture of what could happen in the future, then uh, we need to work more and um, uh, add sectoral coverage. Um, in my personal opinion, that the most uh, important sectors that are missing are um, raw materials, metals, uh, chemicals, um, bio-based products, uh, and uh, also the, the issue of uh, circularity, reuse, recycling, etc., which is um, not really um, done yet at that point. The next aspect is environmental coverage. So uh, while in, in prospective LCI databases, we, we can use them, of course, for a full environmental assessment. Uh, one very important um, thing to keep in mind is that they are generated uh, based on IAMs. At this point in the IAMs, they have a strong focus on, on climate change and not so much on all of the other impact categories that we typically look at. Uh, so we should be a little bit more careful uh, when interpreting results for other impact categories. And we should perhaps also uh, put some work behind that to improve the quality uh, of data for other impact categories. And perhaps the planetary boundaries concept can help us a little bit prioritize efforts here. Another point is consistency versus quality or detail. So. Of course, uh, 
we would like our scenario data to be consistent, uh, but also as good as possible. Uh, and that's kind of a, um, yeah, an impossible request because there is no single consistent data source that covers everything at a sufficient techn technological uh, level of detail. Um, so the solution is probably to use additional data sources to complement uh, IAMs because IAMs also don't have the data for everything. Uh, and a better solution might be to use that data and then to also improve the IAMs so that we can uh, achieve some, some more consistency in that data. A, another uh, aspect that um, is probably emerging now uh, with the increased use of prospective LCI databases is uh, that for now we have no no harmonization and, and no, well, no is exaggerated, but little harmonization and acceptance. Um, we, we have a diversity of scenarios, um, but the more diversity we have, that may be scientifically interesting, but the more uh, it, it also complicates the comparison of LCA studies. So from a harmonization perspective, we actually should have probably a smaller set of scenarios that are well designed and then um, widely accepted by the LCA community. Uh, sharing is also uh, uh, an issue that uh, still needs to be improved. Uh, so currently the public sharing of PLCI databases is hindered by licensing restrictions of LCI databases. And um, uh, there's two solutions currently available. One is basically to locally generate the prospective LCI databases if you have the data under license yourself. Uh, that's obviously targeted at, at expert users. And the other solution is um, asking the generators of these respective LCI databases if they can share it, uh, but that's not something that scales very well. So for a wider application of this, we, we need um, to find better solutions here. Now, I already talked about a um, little bit about the obstacles of using multiple background systems in LCA software. Um, I tried to put a goal here. So LCA software should ideally enable users to switch the background scenario and to perform LCA's four scenarios in a very simple and, and automated way. And the superstructure approach here is a possible solution to that. I think I already explained that before, so I won't go into detail again. But in principle, you want to work with uh, just one background uh, database that can be turned into different scenarios. And ideally, you'd just like to click once uh, to uh, tell the software, uh, calculate an LCA now for this foreground system against all of the different scenarios that are represented uh, by the background system. And this is currently implemented in the activity browser, but uh, of course that um, uh, similar implementations um, are needed in, in more mainstream LCA software to, um, to enable a wider use of prospective LCI databases. And finally, interpretation is another really important uh, aspect. Uh, so what LCA practitioners really need to understand is what background scenarios represent. So what, what do these databases actually stand for? What are the storylines? What are the main sectors that have been adapted? Uh, what are the data sources? Uh, what are the institutions behind? All of these questions so to, to build some understanding and trust and also what the limitations of these data sources are. So for example, what is not included in there, which environmental dimensions should be uh, seen with uh, some, uh, yeah, with a grain of salt. And uh, that information is really important to correctly interpret and communicate LCA results. And for that, um, LCA practitioners should have better guidance uh, available. Now let me uh, summarize that uh, in a vision uh, that um, uh, these authors here are currently working on. Um, uh, the vision is that we, we ba basically have a 
better developed um, pipeline of or system of uh, genera generating, sharing and using prospective LCI databases involving a number of different actors. So for example, scenario generators, the IAM people perhaps, uh, that provide scenario data, uh, LCA, LCI data pro uh, providers that provide LCI data, um, then the scenario integrators that integrate that uh, into prospective LCI databases. Uh, we need solutions for sharing and then solutions within the software uh, by software providers so that LCA practitioners in the end can do um, meaningful prospective LCA. And some of the qualities that prospective LCI databases should have in that respect is that they should um, be science-based, science so based on best available data and models, transparent, reproducible and consistent. Uh, they should be covering uh, sectors of broad uh, relevance and uh, the environment in as good as they can. Uh, LCA practitioners should easily um, be able to access them and to use them in LCA software. And um, sufficient interpretation material should be available. And this whole pipeline of uh, information um, or, and, and work here should be well maintained to provide regular updates and uh, improvements to LCA practitioners. So let me close with a couple of conclusions. So. Uh, good scenarios really matter for LCA results. Uh, LCA results are very important for um, influencing stakeholder opinions and for driving decision making. And I think we as, a, as an LCA community have um, a very high responsibility to, to getting that right and giving the best information we can um, to our stakeholders um, so we can take the right decisions. Uh, I'm very hopeful because I see um, that the systematic generation of prospective LCI databases is ongoing. This is exciting and it's uh, an important development for prospective LCA. Uh, prospective LCI databases are increasingly being used, at least for now in, in academia. But of course, a lot of work remains to improve these databases and make them ready for uh, use in LCA practice, and, and this is certainly a collaborative effort uh, of many people in the LCA community and, and a bit beyond. I'd just like to point to the links here to the open source tools uh, and to the selected references, and then thank all of you very much for listening, and I'm very curious to hear your questions now, um, and I'd also like to thank um, many of my great colleagues who um, made all of this uh, possible and and who um, yeah uh, did a lot of the work on on which i presented today uh, that's great thank you bernard uh eva should we go through the questions yeah thank you so much for this nice presentation yeah, we have quite a lot of questions. I'm going to start with this one. Uh, this one uh, by combining all databases to have a, su a superstructure, is there a risk of losing information or having broad results when evaluating impacts in the future? Technically not. So uh, the, the superstructure approach basically um, results in the same as having these individual databases um, and um, Normally, these you know these individual bases, databases are quite similar in terms of economic structure, uh, and then the superstructure would uh, essentially look very similar. And that scenario difference file would uh, basically overwrite some of the values to turn that into a scenario. So, it's um, mathematically that should be identical, and result-wise that should be identical. Uh, the only case where the superstructure database becomes more difficult to use is when the underlying scenarios are hugely different in terms of economic structure. Okay, thank you. And this is another question from Matteo Kommel. Uh, regarding the scenarios on material impact, 
Thus, prospective scenarios presented take into consideration that besides the energy carbon intensity should reduce over time, the need for energy will increase due to material minerals stop running low and mines being less concentrated in these minerals. Um, I would say yes, uh, it, it should include that. Um, and that, that's what we're seeing with the shift to renewables that sometimes we actually, uh, or, or electrification that sometimes we, we need a little bit more uh, energy, but as long as that is produced by renewables um, to an increasing share, I think then we're on a good way. But yes, it should be included. Uh, this is here another question from Romilin. Uh, to complete the data of integrated assessment models, do you think that a stakeholder participation could be useful or is it more useful when developing foreground scenarios? Yeah, I would tend to say that stakeholder participation is especially important for developing foreground scenarios. Um, for developing background scenarios, probably as well but I'm less of an expert on how you would do that, uh, right? So that this could perhaps happen at the at the level of where, when the IAMs are being uh, produced. And I, there's probably also some stakeholder involvement um, happening to, to uh, get that data. Um, how to do that systematically, I would say that's easier to describe for a small, well-defined foreground system than for the entire global economy. Yeah, I will agree with you. Uh, so this is one question from Mario Martin Gamboa. So the carbonization of the electricity system may be different across countries, for example, in Europe. Is it possible to incorporate specific national scenarios on premise, premise in order to obtain a more regionalized prospective database? Yes, I think technically that's possible to sort of superimpose uh, scenarios on top of each other so that you would basically start to generate such a database with regional data and then add on top of that um, more, uh, let's say, country level or, or even more local data. And here there's another question on the practicalities. Uh, from Joris Simaitis. Hi, I'm conducting very similar prospective LCA using different integrated assessment models. Uh, TM from UCL. Can we new integrated assessment models data be added to premise? Uh, I think for that, I, I would recommend that you contact the, the premise developer, uh, Romain Saki, um, to discuss that. Okay. And uh, based on your experience, what has been the best way to define design the assumptions for these scenarios? That's a question I think I have to pass on. <laughs> I, I don't really know. OK. Um, and we, here we, we have in a different context um, developed a methodology to to uh, develop foreground scenarios and we're in the process of, of publishing that um, so for foreground scenarios i could give you more information perhaps uh, for background scenarios in general i find it very difficult to answer um how the approaches methodologies presented here relate with consequential lca oh that's a really tough one um and it's, I can only turn it around. I, I would like to understand that better myself because I think that consequential LCA uh, has to offer uh, something here. And uh, it would be interesting to see how we can perhaps, um, you know, incorporate ideas or concepts from, from consequential uh, LCA here. And we have also the comment from James Joyce. Uh, he sent a paper and on perspective on perspective LCA database sharing. The software itself isn't being actively actively developed at the moment. That's my bad. But integrating the concept into the premise for more might be interesting. Do you think this is something that could be done? It's a paper. Yeah. I'm not following a hundred percent. I know that um, the Futura software was developed at some point and that's a very nice um, piece of software that basically um, uh, uses recipes to um, to generate 
retrospective LCI databases and, and uh, these recipes can be stored. And that's a, actually an interesting solution for also documenting in a transparent way um, how prospective LCA databases are being generated. Um, sorry, that's not exactly the answer to the question. <laughs> I'm happy to answer by email also. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of more questions. So if you would like to write them into the chat and in the meanwhile, in the meantime, um, I would like to know how would you hope to see the use of these prospect prospective LCA databases in five, 10 years from now? Yeah, that's also a good question. So I would hope that, um, uh, as I said, that we have a, a well-developed pipeline of what I showed before so that we have all of, uh, you know, a stable set of actors who develop these uh, databases uh, who are really deeply knowledgeable about that, who build something that we can trust in a similar way as we can trust uh, existing LCI um, databases, uh, or at least we, we know their limitations, but we can also trust them to, to a good degree. Um, and I would hope that these databases would be uh, easily available for people uh, to use, easily understandable because maybe well described, uh, and that they really find their way into um, prospective LCA and actually uh, sometimes if I think about prospective LCA, I'm also asking myself, um, yeah, I, I, this sometimes sounds like an exotic uh, part of doing LCA, but actually at, at least in academia, most of us are looking into the future. Uh, so this is actually very relevant and we, sh yeah, we, we should have databases available that, that represent future systems. Yeah, I think it's very important, but sometimes it's very difficult to translate that into if you don't have the knowledge to do to, inc to incorporate that. And this is one question from Clea. Uh, if one have access to EcoInvent by using Sima Pro, how to start using prospective EcoInvent inventories? Is, is this feasible right now? It is feasible right now. Um, so um, you can either ask the premise developers uh, for these databases, or you can uh, generate them uh, yourself locally. Um, then you do end up with this problem of having uh, a larger number of uh, databases representing different scenarios and different time steps. Uh, so even if you just want to look at two scenarios for one year, that still means you have two distinct background databases in SEMA Pro. Uh, because Semaphore does not yet um, implement um, a solution that facilitates this, this kind of modeling. Yeah, that would be easy to or useful to simplify the process somehow to 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 use this because it, this is very important and interesting. And I think I, I will close with this question. Uh, you've referenced Semaphore, but how about how about Open LCA? Are there any any plans to consider Open LCA? Yes, my my apologies. Uh, I think you can probably also use it with OpenLCA. Um, that was simply not in the picture uh, from the, from the paper that I used there. Uh, but essentially, the idea from the premise developers is that the um, databases can be exported in a in different formats that can be read uh, by by all major LCA softwares. So thank you so much. I think we are going to close now. Um, thank you. It has been very interesting and really lo looking forward to, to see how we can use these databases in our own LCA projects. And thank you for being here. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. Same here. Yeah, thanks, Bernard. Uh, thanks, everyone. And yeah, have a good day. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.